So another way to implement our access control matrix is to use capabilities. So capabilities provide us with a row-wise view of the access matrix. So with capabilities, actually a subject has the indications in which ways it is to allowed to access which objects. So for each subject, now we keep a list with permissions that subject holds to a number of given objects. One simple example for this is uh, Unix file descriptors. So Unix file descriptors are actually propagated, as you know, using the fork system call. So uh, by propagating such a capability, so having obtained the right to access this file, you can pass it on to your child processes. And this allows to access files without repeated validation of the Unix success permissions. So you've opened it once, you have uh, this file descriptor, which is essentially a token that allows you to access the file, and you can even pass it on. So essentially, uh, you have a system-wide table of open files here, and inside of your process control block, you have file descriptors here, and one of these file descriptors then points to one of your files in the table of open files and whenever you create a child process then if you uh, just don't close the descriptors then all of these descriptors here are inherited so you can pass on the capability to access this file to additional processes and finally we have a rule-based access matrix for mandatory access control so here all subjects and all objects possess attributes which we call labels and the decision about granting access of a subject to a certain object is done by evaluating given rules. I don't want to go into too much details here. This can get quite complicated, but this is actually uh, implemented in some real-world systems in so-called security kernels, for example, in the SE Linux uh, version, which is a security-hearted Linux version. And the, the important thing is that these rules have to be evaluated for every access using a set of uh, rules that is stored in the system. Now, system software alone has a hard time really taking care of security, so it usually needs some support by the hardware. So we have two general methods of protection based in hardware. One is the MMU, which we've uh, already seen uh, when we discussed uh, page-based memory management, virtual memory management. And the other way is to provide so-called protection rings, so different execution modes for your code that have different capabilities of the system available to them. And these hardware-based protection mechanisms have to be used and complemented by protection in the system software. So uh, first, we need to ensure that the operating system has exclusive control of all the hardware, because if we granted some user process access to a piece of the hardware, then uh, this user process might abuse this hardware access to do things the operating system would want. Uh, also, the operating system needs to have control, exclusive control of all processes and of all resources in our system, no matter what. And uh, to uh, actually enable secure access to this, it needs to provision identification mechanisms, authentication mechanisms, uh, the separation of privileges, and maybe also cryptographic protection of information, for example, for network connections like HTTPS or SSH connections. So one part of our hardware-based protection mechanism is the memory management unit. As we've already seen, this is a hardware component, usually as part of the CPU, though early MMUs were separate chips. And the MMU translates um, program accesses to memory. So essentially, a program doesn't get direct access to physical memory, but all program-generated code and data addresses are translated into physical addresses. And when this translation takes place, the access to these physical addresses can also be controlled. So we can check if a process actually has a permission to access a certain uh, address in memory. So we're translating the process view, the virtual addresses into the hardware view, the physical addresses. And while we're doing this, we check if the access that was attempted by the program is actually valid. And in order to make this a bit easier, we've seen that our main memory is partitioned into pages of, uh, well, usually identical size, like four kilobytes, but we can also have larger pages. And we enable protection, so memory protection, by only mapping the exact set of required main memory pages into the virtual address space of the process. So a process only gets access to that part of the physical memory pages. So it's always a granularity of, for example, four kilobytes that it really needs access to. 
Then using the MMU, we can isolate physical address spaces of different processes. So each process has its own page table and we have to switch page tables when we switch processes to enable this isolation here. And uh, to ensure access controls on a more fine grade level, we also have protection bits as with files. We also have them for pages here. And these are controlled at every access. So they are controlled uh, when you read, write, or execute code against the read, write, execute bits indicated in the page table for your page. And uh, in addition, you can have to several privilege levels. For example, you can have some pages, even if they're mapped into a virtual address space, only be accessible if you're running in the privileged, so super user mode or supervisor mode of the CPU, whereas uh, you can have other pages uh, accessible also in user mode of the CPU. Now, this principle of different modes of your CPU has actually been extended in several computers. Um, most well-known are uh, x86 machines here, and uh, these machines actually implement the concept of protection rings. So you no longer have only two levels of separation, so a supervisor and a user mode, but additional ones. So you have several rings here, so the kernel runs in the highest privileged mode because it has to have access to all of the hardware and resources of your system, so it runs in ring zero, and then you have additional rings. Usually the least privileged uh, code runs in the outer ring, ring three, this is your user mode code running user processes, and rings in between are usually not used in modern Unixes nowadays, but they can be used, for example, to run device drivers here. So a device driver that malfunctions wouldn't actually immediately kill your kernel. So if whatever a USB device driver for your USB mouse would fail, it wouldn't di directly crash your kernel and you could at least uh, continue to use your computer to save data and, and maybe reboot it. So rings restrict the usable subset of processor machine instructions. So for example, disabling interrupts is not permitted in any rings outside of ring zero. So whenever any code in ring one or two, maybe a device driver wants to disable interrupts, it has to request this from the kernel running in ring zero. And also the accessible address range for the process is restricted. So essentially virtual page entries are actually tagged with the ring uh, that is given access to this. This is, uh, for example, used to disable I.O. accesses. And when you want to change from one ring to another, for example, for doing system calls or something, you have to use so-called call gates here. And these call gates are special hardware trap mechanisms that actually enable the control of tr uh, control flow transfer into code running in a different ring. And it only does this like an exception at certain predefined addresses so the code running at this high privilege level like our kernel executing a system call can actually be enabled to check if this was a valid and legal call done by an application process. So in addition to this hardware-based protection we need software-based protection and the first thing we need is sort of an identification mechanism for users. So we've already seen that Unix systems provide each user with a unique user ID and each user is a member of at least one group and each group also has its own unique group ID and these are just numerical values and since users don't usually want to log in using their numerical login ID uh, for human use they are translated into texts so just strings uh, like giving uh, the username Michael to the user ID 100 for example and this takes place in a special file which is called etc password or passwd so it's just a text file uh, in the etc directory that stores information about passwords and we've already seen that all resources in the system are assigned an owner and this owner is identified giving the unix user id in unix we've already seen there's a special user the root or super user which has a user id of zero and this is very problematic. This user has all permissions possible in the system. So if any other user or external attacker gains access to, for example, a shell executing with the uh, privileges of our super user, then that attacker or user can actually do anything on the system that's possible. So uh, to enable user IDs to work reliably, we need users to authenticate to the system. So essentially a user has to somehow obtain a valid user ID and to get this user ID assigned uh, for a session, for example, a login session, uh, 
the user has to provide credentials. So a username and a password, for example, uh, using the uh, Unix login program, which is started whenever you start your machine or whenever you log into a terminal. And this just reads in your username and password and then reads the etc password file to verify that your username is actually well at once so that this username exists on the system. And then it verifies the entire password with the one recorded in this password file in the system. Uh, it doesn't do a text comparison of the characters entered because that would mean that your password would be unencrypted in the password file. That would be a big security problem, obviously. So usually your password is stored encrypted or hashed in a password file. So uh, it's very difficult to really obtain the real world password out of it, the clear text password. So what's done is that the login process takes the characters of your password you entered and then either encrypts it and compares the encrypted value to the stored encrypted value in the password file or it does a hash over your password characters and compares it with a stored hash value. And of course, these hashes have to be uh, good enough to avoid collisions in the common cases. And after that, as we've seen, the login process starts the first user process, usually a shell. And the login process also changes the shell's user ID and group ID to the user and group ID of the user who has just logged in. So, uh, what you do usually is, uh, in order to avoid any, anyone reading clear text password, is you use a cryptographic protection of information. So in Unix, uh, for a long time, usually the DES encryption standard was used for user passwords. And originally, these passwords were stored in the file etc password. So uh, each line of this etc password file shown here is an entry for a single user. So the first one is our root user. This is the encrypted password of our root user. Then we have a user ID. We see root has a user ID of zero and a group ID of zero also. Then we have a clear text name. So this is system administrator here. Uh, we have a home directory. So this home directory is var root. And we have the program to start a login, which has been sh. So if I log into my Unix system as root, I get assigned the user and group ID zero and I'm placed in the directory var root and a shell is started for me with my credentials, with my permissions. There's another user called daemon with another password here, which has a user and group ID of one. This is a user usually used for running system services. So system services don't have full root permissions because they don't need them. So this is trying to apply the least privilege principle here. And this, for example, has a very special login shell, use of in false. So false is a program that just returns false. So when you try to start this program as a login shell, it just locks you out again. So even if daemon has a password here, uh, you cannot log in as a user daemon at a terminal or at your console. And then there's maybe a user me with some password here, which is encrypted with user and group ID of 1000 respectively. This is in this case myself with a home directory of home me and I get a bash shell started whenever I log into the system. Now the problem is that this password file is also used by the system to map user IDs to usernames and the other way around and to find home, home directories of users and so on. So this password file had to be readable for all users of the system. In turn, this means that all users of the system also had access to your encrypted password. Now, well, it's encrypted, so it doesn't matter, right? Well, it didn't matter at the time when this mechanism was invented, like in the 1970s, because computers were far too slow to have any sensible way of attacking this uh, password encryption in reasonable amounts of time. Now, unfortunately, computers got much faster, including GPUs. So uh, with more uh, modern computers, you could actually do a so-called brute force attack uh, given enough time. So you could just make a copy of that uh, password file and then run it on a different machine to try to decrypt the passwords. And brute force might also either mean you go through all possible combinations of letters and characters and digits and whatever. Uh, but of course, there's a more sensible option, which is also exploiting human, well, laziness, essentially, because, you know, the most common password on Earth is password and the next most common password is one, two, three, four, five, six. So usually when doing brute force password attacks, what you do, you have a list of very common clear text passwords and you encrypt them one after the other and you compare them to the encrypted passwords here. And as soon as you have a match and this may take a day or a week, but if you have enough time, that's no problem. Uh, and as soon as you have a match, then, well, you can log into the system because then you know the clear text password. 
So this was obviously problematic. So what Unix did is they actually kicked out the encrypted passwords out of etc password because they were only actually used by the login process, which is running with root privileges. So actually passwords don't need to be stored in etc password. And they were actually then uh, put into a separate file etc shadow. So it's a shadow password file, which essentially is only readable by root and a group called shadow which is maybe some login processes here, whereas the regular shadow uh, password file is readable by everyone on the system, so every, every other user here, for example. And this means that now uh, you don't have access to these encrypted passwords any longer, even if you're a user of that system, unless you're root, obviously. And uh, this means uh, that it gets much harder for at least to uh, obtain decrypted clear text passwords. Now another problem that regularly shows up when considering security is software bugs. So when developing software, you usually have to make a trade-off between performance of the system and security of the system. And one very good example for this is arrays in C. So uh, arrays have a dimension, like you have a character array of 10 characters. And if you wanted to ensure that no access goes beyond these 10 characters, you would need to check that the index for accessing this array is always in between uh, 0 and 9, for example. So uh, if you added these checks before every access to the array, then this means that your array access will get significant, significantly slower. And the same happens for pointers and any other maybe dynamic data structures also. And languages actually uh, not supporting this automatic memory management like C, C++, or assembler are called unmanaged languages. So they provide direct access to pointers to any memory locations. They uh, don't check array bounds. They don't check value overflows and numbers. But because they don't check these, because checks are additional machine instructions, they can generate much faster code. On the other hand, there are a large number of so-called managed languages. Some prominent examples are C Sharp and Java. And these actually don't give the user access to direct pointers and they check array bounds and value uh, ranges and stuff like that. And that means they're not usable for system software development. Think about why this is a problem. Um, and they're not a solution for all of the security problems of unmanaged languages because also managed languages tend to have security problems. And some of the problems uh, we're going to discuss now, one of the problems are buffer overflows and the other one are value range overflows. And you might wonder like if I do really careful programming, well I'm a good programmer, I'm programming for several years, I won't make these errors. No you will. There's statistics. So uh, on average there's one error per thousand lines of code. Uh, so one significant security error. And this is actually independent of the implementation language. So no matter which language you use, you are prone to make errors, unfortunately. So let's first look at value ranges. So the problem here is that integer numbers in computers are represented as bit strings, and these bit strings have a finite number of bits, so a limited number of bits. For example, a character in C is usually represented as a signed 8-bit uh, value. So uh, I can have a character A, which has a value of 127, and a character B, which has a value of 3. And of course, this would translate into ASCII values if we want to print them, for example, on most computers. So if we have eight bits, we usually store them as two's complement values. So this means we have a value range of two uh, of minus two to the seventh, two plus two to the seventh minus one, or in decimal numbers, just minus 128 to plus 127. And here we see, uh, okay, this calculation might get problematic because we add three to 127. So we would expect this result to be 130. But if we look at the binary calculation here, what we do is we have the binary representation of 127 here and the binary representation of 3. And when we add them together, we have a result that actually has the most significant bit set. And in two's complement number, a set most significant bit indicates that this result is negative. And our computer, since we uh, know that characters are signed 8-bit values, actually would interpret this as a negative value, so as minus 126 instead of plus 130. Now, of course, we could start a discussion why it makes sense to have characters as negative values also, but this probably goes a bit too far here. 
So when we have such a problem with value overflows, of course you might think, okay, the biggest problem might be, oh yeah, I got a wrong character on the screen, who cares? But of course you could use these character values also as, for example, an array index. So uh, here we have a character string of 127 characters containing a string hello world. We have our two character declarations here with definitions of 127 and three again. And then we have a function here with, that takes a string pointer at an index and just returns the character at that index here. And then we call my func with the string here as the first parameter and then a plus b, which is a character value. So a plus b is actually minus 126 and not 130 as we've seen before. So it would actually access a completely different memory value, which is even 126 bytes to the left of the start of our string. So this is definitely a problematic code uh which results uh well for, which is a result from having this uh, integer value overflow here and if we wanted to check for these overflows here we would either need hardware checks some cpus would enable this uh, but this is not very common or we would need to check this in software so we need to check after each arithmetic operation if we're actually still inside of the valid value range and this uh, to take a lot of overhead Another problem that may occur is heap overflow. So as we've seen in our heap allocator, a heap is of course our memory alloc uh, area reserved for dynamically allocated data, for example, using malloc. And buffer overflows in the heap can be problematic because as you've seen, these memory ranges are allocated one after the other. And then the only thing you returned is a pointer to the start of that range. So when a malicious program or an erroneous program actually tries to access bytes beyond that range, it just actually accesses bytes as the next allocated block. If it reads it, well, it gets some crazy and correct information back. If it writes outside of its malloc block, well, then it overwrites different data. And this is obviously very problematic. So if you try to pass incorrect sizes for data regions, uh, then an attacker can actually overwrite other data on the heap. And this happened regularly. For example, in the Microsoft uh, JPEG decoder for uh, in the GDI package here. So uh, in JPEG files, so JPEG image files, you have size values, for example, for resolutions and color depths and so on. And this Microsoft JPEG decoder actually didn't check for the size values. So of course, normal for image files just contain valid values, which give valid memory accesses in turn which do not result in erroneous behavior, but uh, manipulated image files where you actually manipulate maybe one of the size values here by hand with a hex editor, they contain invalid values. So this would enable any program using this Microsoft JPEG decoder, which is part of a DLL of a library, then to overwrite other heap data. And this other heap data might be a password, for example, by coincidence. And so uh, you might be able to break into that system that uses this JPEG library. Of course, this is long fixed, so you don't need to worry about that specific security problem, only about the billion other ones. So this is an example code demonstrating the problem. So we define two constants, buffer size of 16 and over size of eight. So this is the overflow of eight bytes we want to generate. And then we just allocate two buffers here, buffer one and buffer two uh, of 16 bytes each. Uh, we calculate the difference here, we print them out here, and then we set our first uh, uh, buffer to A. So we use memset to set all of the characters in uh, that uh, buffer. So the first 15 ones to A and then use a string. Uh, where when we implement this as a string, we actually add a zero to it. And then uh, before overflow, we print the other buffer here we print the original buffer and then we set the first buffer here to contain b's but actually we mem set more b's than actually our memory that was allocated so we not only allocate the difference between those but we allocate like uh, we write eight b's more and so we also print our buffer contents as string after we created this overflow so as a result, the value range of one of the uh, malloc areas is exceeded by eight bytes. So when we start our program, well, we say, okay, buffer one has this address here, buffer two is somewhere else. So we have a difference of hexadecimal FFO bytes. So now we write FF eight bytes 
So before the overflow, our buffer 2 contained the 15 A's as we've written into there. And after the overflow, we see that our uh, MEMS set has actually copied 8 B's into the heap area of uh, the other element. And of course, it has also overwritten quite a number of bytes in addition in between. So buff 1 exceeds its limit, arrives at the heap area in which buffer 2 is stored. This still has valid contents because we're using this other, uh, afterwards to print the contents. And then we see that actually this data is overwritten without the program or the user actually noticing. So to conclude, let's give a few real-world examples of malware. So a very early example is the so-called Morris Worm, which exploited a uh, buffer overflow in the sendmail daemon on Unix. So sendmail is the Unix program responsible for sending, uh, for sending emails, actually. And this is one of the first worms that was distributed over the internet in 1988. It was written by a student of Cornell University, Robert Tappan Morris, and was activated in November 88 from a computer not at Cornell University, but at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, so at MIT, to actually disguise the real origin of the worm. Now, today Robert Morris is actually a professor at MIT, which is interesting because this uh, actually went totally wrong. So what uh, Morris did is in his program he exploited a security hole in the sendmail system. So uh, we've already seen that we shouldn't use the get s call because it's very difficult to avoid buffer overflows there. And sendmail used get s, so Morris was actually able to uh, generate a buffer overflow that actually would inject code into the sendmail program that would enable this worm to propagate to other systems. Actually, this wasn't meant to really exploit security holes per se and to get un uh, access to information. Uh, it was uh, just a valid research question. And the question back then is how big is the internet? So how many hosts are actually connected to the internet? And so the idea was that this Morse worm should infect each system only once and then maybe increment a counter and deliver this back. Unfortunately, it had a fatal bug in its replication function and it implemented systems multiple and even many times. So these systems were overloaded. They uh, were just busy sending out mails containing the worm to other systems. And that's, of course, not in the interest of the system administrator. Overall, 6,000 Unix systems were infected and the cost of fixing the damages uh, caused by the Morris worm was estimated between uh, to be between uh, 10 and 100 million US dollars because, uh, well, you had to downtime of your systems, you had to reinstall systems so that took time, so people had to work for it. And so that was quite a bit of overhead. And uh, Morris was actually convicted to three years on probation and a $10,000 file, but it didn't seem to hurt his career because, as I've said, now he's a professor at MIT, so the institution he actually abused to start his virus. And <laughs> MIT actually has the original floppy disk containing the Morris Worm source code on exhibition, but I'm not sure if this floppy disk is actually still readable after like 31 years or something. Another early value, uh, ver another early virus that was discovered in 1991 is the Michelangelo virus. And this was first discovered in New Zealand. And this is a typical boot sector virus. So this infects, for example, MS-DOS systems. So standard x86 PCs. It only uses BIOS functions, no DOS system calls. So it's very simple and it can run on any uh, PC hardware. And this was time activated to be active on March the 6th. And uh, when it was activated, it overwrote the first 100 sectors of the first hard disk in your system with zeros. Obviously, deleting the, your FAT, your uh, boot record, and your directory entries. So this made a big mess of all of the systems uh, that were infected. And this virus was distributed using boot sectors of floppy disks, and it installed itself in the boot sector of the hard disk then. And this was one of the first viruses that was broadly discussed in the media, but its effects were actually spectacularly exaggerated, especially because, uh, well, when the time came, it was actually activated March the 6th. Most people knew about this and were able to remove the virus from their system. However, even some commercial software was accidentally delivered on disks with a boot sector virus. So even when you bought an original floppy disk containing a piece of software from an original vendor, you might accidentally have uh, just gotten infected by a virus. Now today, uh, you might still get viruses and USB memory sticks, and there's even mobile phones with USB interfaces. 
uh, that might provide you with viruses fresh from the factory because the systems in the factory just uh, doing the manufacturing and initial installation of these USB sticks and uh, mobile phones uh, were infected themselves. So things like these actually happened. And another example, uh, which is a very horrible piece of malware, is the Sony BMG rootkit. And yes, we ex explicitly need to single out Sony and BMG here as the bad companies. So uh, Sony actually provided uh, software on copy protected CD-ROMs with so-called digital rights management, so digital restriction management technology. And this automatically installed a filtering driver for CD drives and IDE disk controllers that actually control the access to the media in your Windows system. And this was installed without informing the user or asking for the user's approval. And this actually enabled the control of the use of data by this malware written by Sony BMG on any uh, affected Windows system. So if you want to use the software, actually you gain software that, for example, uh, disabled uh, copying uh, music from CD-ROMs and stuff like this. And this was actually hidden from any malware analysis using rootkit functionality, so it did not appear in the installed software list of the Windows Control Center. It was not removable using standard uninstaller tools. It did hide related files and directories and processes and also registry entries related to this malware. And uh, it did not only do this, but it did it in a very simple way because everything was just marked with a string dollar sys dollar. So this rootkit actually hid everything that just started with a string dollar sys dollar. So uh, this was very widespread by users, for example, of some Sony software. So people actually then having this rootkit uh, unknowingly installed on the system, uh, gave an attack vector to additional malware that uh, was able to hide using the Sony BMG rootkit because by naming every process is also starting with dollar sys dollar, they were able to hide without having to provide their own rootkit functionality. So this was horrible and companies uh, doing this need to be fined significantly when they try to do this on your personal systems or wherever. Now this Sony rootkit was unexpected, but was finally discoverable and removable. But there was research on building rootkits that were actually undiscoverable. And one of these ex early examples is the so-called blue pill rootkit. So this is related to, to a site, uh, to, to a quote from the Matrix movie, obviously. And this is a virtual machine based rootkit. Uh, so Discovery and removal of rootkits on the OS level, like the Sony BMG rootkit, is possible, but it's costly because you have to invest time and maybe reinstall stuff and so on. So the objective for research was really to build an undiscoverable rootkit, and this blue pill rootkit tried to infect a PC with a rootkit without requiring a system reboot, and it did this by actually enabling hardware virtualization mode while the system was running, putting itself as the hypervisor into this special privilege string, which we usually call minus one on that system, uh, to then fool the operating system into thinking it's still running on the real physical hardware, but intercepting all accesses of the operating system and maybe manipulating them. So because this was using hardware virtualization, it was not causing any significant performance impact. So it was really, really difficult to figure out what was going on. And actually, mostly transparently passed through all of the devices like GPUs and disk controllers uh, to the uh, OS now running in virtualization after the rootkit installed itself to the system. So you wouldn't have to reinstall drivers or something like this. So this was thought to be undiscoverable since the operating system actually never noticed it is now running in a virtual machine. And according to the Popek Goldberg requirements on virtualization, so if you think back to our virtualization lecture, uh, this should actually be undiscoverable. But there are still luckily side effects that enable the detections of rootkits like this. But it took researchers quite some time to figure out how this actually worked. So to conclude, we've seen and we've of course known already that security gains increasing relevance, especially in networked environments, and that there are extremely significant damages done due to viruses, phishing, botnets, ransomware. And this is not only dam damages to equipment or to money, but maybe even people could be endangered if a security problem would affect some safety mechanisms in a train or, or an airplane or something like this. And even if you're an experienced computer user, you're not safe from malware. Please don't believe this. So building in security checks into your code is essential, but automated tests cannot find all errors. 
So you'd still need to do manual so-called audits of code. So people really looking over the code, looking for specific patterns and trying to figure out, might this be a security problem? Uh, nevertheless, security problems are unavoidable because bugs are unavoidable. So as a consequence, system software has to be constantly updated. And of course, if updates stop, for example, for many mobile phones after a year or two, then actually it's no longer safe to use this device in a networked environment, which would make a mobile phone essentially unusable. And that's what causes what we call forced obsolescence. So lots of electronic wastes. And this is, of course, well, a whack-a-mole game. So essentially, uh, well, uh, there's a competition between authors of malware and authors of virus scanners and anti-malware software tools. And what's really important are the so-called zero-day exploits. So these are newly discovered security holes, which are not yet published and uh, especially not fixed. And these are extremely dangerous because there's, uh, well, no way to defend against them. And uh, usually whenever uh, such a security exploit is published, the reaction time uh, until you get an update of your system software to fix this depends uh, on your vendor. So it can take hours, which is fine, but it can also take months until a special security problem is fixed. And uh, this would, of course, be uh, very dangerous to run the system in, in the intervening time uh, when uh, connected to the Internet or any other network. Uh, another problem which we didn't mention here in detail is that hardware is also increasingly problematic since hardware also offers side channels. And if you're more interested in this, uh, take a look at Meltdown and Spectre. This has been in the press for the last, uh, last couple of years. So I guess you've already heard about this. So uh, thanks for listening. Uh, we'll have another lecture on security in which we dig a bit deeper into security details, especially in C. And, uh, well, this is not a replacement for a complete course on security. So if you're interested in this topic, uh, I would uh, advise you to actually attend uh, additional lectures on security. Uh, this is really important, especially for your future career in software, if you want to go this way. So thanks for listening and until next time. Bye.